Okay, uh, so this is Antonio Cuny and I'm Maciej Fiokowski and we're gonna talk a bit about uh, Python and PyPy performance today. And who are we? We are PyPy core developers. We also work on a bunch of other projects. The maybe most well known one is CFFI, which is a way to call C, and a bunch of other projects. We also do consulting and run a company, Barak Software. So, well, let's start with the, the usual quote that pre-major optimization is the root of all evil, and that you usually end up spending 20, 80% of your time and 20% of your code, but it's important to remember that 20% of 1 million lines is still 200,000 lines, so it's 20% tends to scale with the size too, and that can cause trouble if your program is not 10 lines of code. We're gonna talk a bit about how to identify slow pods and how to optimize them. So the, the first part, I'll talk about the profiling tools and how do you go about saying what's wrong, and the other one, uh, Antonio will talk how to address those problems. So yes, the first, first is identifying the slow, slow spots. What, what is performance? Like, did who ever tried to optimize something? Most people, good. Uh, <laughs> well, <laughs> it's a valid question. Uh, it's usually, so usually it's a time we spend doing task X. So the task X might be serving one HTTP request or computing one protein or doing one, one of those things, but sometimes it's like number of requests per second, sometimes it's the latency. Uh, and the interesting question here is, what sort of statistical property are you actually interested in? Do you care about the average? Do you care about the, the worst case scenario? Like, I don't know, if you're developing a car brake system, the metric you're optimizing is not the average time it takes to brake. It's the worst case scenario it takes to brake. And this is the metric you're, you're working with. Sometimes, sometimes you don't care. Some, if you're serving HTTP requests and one in, 10,000 requests takes 50 milliseconds more than, well, too bad. You, somebody just lost, has to press control R, too bad. Uh, so you, you, it's important to know what you're trying to, to measure first before actually starting to measure. Uh, once you know that, you, it would, it's cool to have some means to measure stuff. So benchmarks are very good. And if you don't have benchmarks, you might want to just check stuff in production, how it actually works on the real, real data, and see if Python is, is your problem or your problem is waiting forever for I.O. or the fact that you have 700 microservices, each of them talking HTTP to each other all the time. Uh, it's important to, to be able to quickly determine whether something that you changed actually changed stuff or it didn't. It's the same as debugging. If it takes you a week to go around and try again the next thing, then chances of optimizing anything are really, really low. Up, up, yeah. No. <laughs> Thanks. No buttons. Uh, okay, so we, we already got to the point where we know Python is our problem. So. I oh, no, looking at top or whatever, we see that Python processes just consume time doing CPU. Uh, one important thing is that systems these days are way too complicated to guess. You cannot just stare at the code and then rewrite it differently and then hope that, oh, but, but I know how Python works. Like, do you really? Uh, I don't, for, for one, and you have to actually measure. You have to see, okay, I run this, it gives me five seconds. I run that, it gave me four seconds. This is win, but I, I actually have a tool to measure that. Again, remember about the, 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 the bottleneck can be small, but can also be really large and like distributed all over the place. Profilers, who used C profile here? Almost everybody. Uh, who used plot? No one. So Plot is a tool done by Dropbox guys, and I think they run it all the time on Dropbox. Uh, so the 
difference is uh, that C profile is a tool that is event based. So each function is instrumented uh, to report. Like now I'm entering the function, start the timer. Now I'm exiting the function and the timer. It's a way to do profiling. Yes, you get function spends, you get time spent in functions, you get tracebacks, you get stuff like that. The problem is that it's a relatively high overhead. On CPython, I think it's like two times, roughly. On FiPy, it's worse. And the problem is that overhead is not evenly spread because overhead is cost per function that's relatively constant. But then if your function does a lot, then the overhead is small. If your function does little, then the overhead is large. And that's, that, that's very bad. That's especially bad on PyPy. So it skews the results towards putting more, more emphasis on small functions than large functions. And VMProf is a tool that we, me and Anto started working on this year, this year, last year, some, something like that. And it's like plop a statistical profiler. So it will sample your code as it's run and see, okay, now I'm in this function. Then wait 30 milliseconds, where am I now? Wait 30 milliseconds, where am I now? And try to capture those stacks and give you statistical information. So it won't tell you how many times the function got called, but it will tell you how much time statistically likely the, the, it's possible to spend there. So VMProv itself is the tool uh, that it was inspired by gperf tools, which is a similar tool for C. Uh, it's based on an interrupt, so it runs on Linux machine about 300 times a second, which is not, not granular enough if your program runs for 10 milliseconds. But if you run a big server that runs for seconds or minutes, you're usually fine and samples the C stack and works on CPython and PyPy and possibly different virtual machines in the future. So the problem why we didn't just use gperf tools is that C stack does not contain usually much useful information. You'd see, if you look at the C stack of, of CPython anywhere, you'd see that 90% of the time is spent in PyEval level frame. Thank you very much. That's not not a useful piece of information, so we want Python level function. The, the, the situation is even worse if you have a just-in-time compiler, which I will talk, talk about later, but we want to be able to reconstruct the Python stack from the C stack snapshot. Demo. Uh, oh. I want to know. Uh, so we have, we have, say a small program that let's pick Pystone because everybody loves Pystone. Where is Pystone? It's leap Python test Pystone, I think. Here. So Pystone is a benchmark that's written for Python 1.1, which who remembers Python 1.1? It <laughs> was a while ago. I don't even know where. Uh, was translated from C to Python to Gita van Rossum and does a bunch of operations like nice style of what's capital false, for example, zero, predates booleans in Python. <laughs> so it's a little data benchmark, but like, fine, let's run it. So I would run Python minus MVM prof, comes as a module. Uh, just run it like this. Boom. Well, that was like, <laughs> that probably was not enough. Let's run it slightly. Stop 100 passes. More. No, even more. Okay, now, now it's running long enough to actually have uh, any useful information. So this will just display uh, the statistical information about which function was spent how much time, so PROC1 was 37%, but this is a little, little useless because we don't see who actually called PROC1, what PROC1 called and stuff, so we have a little web tool for that, web, web 
URL. I'm running this on my local machine because, well, network here, 8000, I think. So we're gonna wait a second, like rerun the benchmark. Okay, it's URL. Let's hope it renders properly. Thinking, thinking. Uh, okay, so here we see that uh, those like the main code that's called main, then called pystones, that called proc zero, which called proc one, func two, and proc eight, that that are directly called by proc zero. If we do the same thing on PyPy. Then we might want more. <laughs> then it's relatively similar, except here we can see that, first of all, the split is slightly different. So you can see that PyPy pi pi somehow optimize stuff, remember those are percentages, so like all of them got faster, but some of them got much faster than the others. You can see that PyPy is not optimizing equally all the code, and here we might see that the, it's a number, and that's, that's JIT code simply, that, that piece was compiled to assembler and run. Uh, I'm working actively on taking this information and making sure it ends in stuff here so you don't see random numbers, you'll just say, okay, this was 100% jitted. Uh, so this is VMProv right now, and it's something that we fixed segfault as of yesterday, so maybe you should be slightly careful, but it's good for trying and seeing if it actually works these days. That was the memo. You should say that it's low overhead. Yes, yes, it's the, the runtime overhead of running VMProv is really, really low. It's, roughly 5% of the time. So we, we want to, yes, that's what I have on the next slide. <laughs> uh, we want, we are looking into a profiler that is possible to deploy the profiler and run profiling all the time. It's not a thing that you can only run benchmarks on somewhere in the isolated corner like C profile, but you can actually like deploy it and get the data coming to you uh, which is again to another point, we want to have the real time monitoring of performance. So you're gonna look in like last hour or filter it by request or stuff like this. Something that I should probably mention is that we are trying to run this as a service where you would just like take the data, upload it somewhere, and we would do some sort of advanced analysis like what happened. Did the code got compiled correctly? Did, did are there like unusual patterns to look for? Uh, well, this is work for the future. Uh, Multithreading multi right now is at least not tested, which probably means it doesn't work. But <laughs> the goal is to make it work. Like the, the signal handlers and everything are designed to work with multithreading. So we just need to look how, how does it look from the Python side. It might obviously work, yeah, who knows? But that probably doesn't. Yes, so as we, as Magic said uh, earlier, when you want to optimize something. Right, our first other buttons, things happen. Okay, perfect. Um, when you want to optimize something first, you have to spot the, uh, the parts of the code who are slow, and then you have to try to make them fast. Well, there are many ways to make Python code faster, and uh, there is, of course, no time to explore all of them. Uh, you can write a C extension, you can use Cyton, you can use Numba, um, and uh, you can rewrite your Python code using tricks, which you can find uh, on, the, on the internet and uh, saying, most of the web pages you find on the web are saying uh, that there are these tricks, but most of the time they just don't work. They, they don't make your code faster, but that's another topic. Or you can use PyPy, PyPy is the, is uh, an alternative implementation, which I, how many of you knows what is PyPy? 
Yes, almost everyone, good. Uh, there. Things changed since uh, 10 Euro Pythons ago when nobody knew what was PyPy. This is a good thing, I think. And uh, yes, PyPy is uh, Python implementation with a JIT compiler. I'm going to, to concentrate on this tool in the next, uh, in the next uh, in this part of the talk because yes, we wrote it, we are biased, and uh, it's an interesting tool. The nice thing about, in comparing to the, to the other tools uh, I'm talking about is that in theory, PyPy gives you most of the, of the wins for free. You don't have to rewrite your code, you don't have to use another tool and et cetera, you just run your Python code and it's, it goes faster. Um, currently, the, uh, we released PyPy 2.6, which has nothing to do with the Python the language version of the uh, of Python, which PyPy 2.6 implements Python 2.7.9. There is also a, a release for Python 3K. And if you are interested in knowing more, there are other EuroPython talk, talks during the, during the week. Um, if you go to speed.pypy.org, you see nice graphs. Mm, saying that it's seven times faster than CPython doesn't mean anything. Of course, it, PyPy is seven times faster on CPy, than CPython on these benchmarks that we, we selected. We are not interested in benchmarks in which we are really fast. We, we, we try to, to select benchmarks in we, we, that shows re, uh, real world problems and et cetera. And on these benchmarks, <laughs> the average is seven times faster. I say that PyPy contains a JIT, which is the, the part that makes, it, makes your code faster. And now I'm briefly going to explain what is a JIT. So suppose you have this, uh, this piece of Python code, which contains uh, function calls and loops and et cetera. And uh, if you interpret your, uh, your program with CPython or PyPy without the JIT, you see that you will spend uh, some time in, uh, in the green part, some time in the, in the blue part, a bigger part of your time in the red and uh, orange parts and et cetera. The, the idea behind the JIT is that we can optimize the, the slower spots by compiling them to assembler so that they execute much faster and then the total time spent in your uh, running your program is, uh, is lower. And uh, of course I cannot go in details because there is no time, uh, we are a bit in a rush, but uh, how does it work? Well, the, the, the key idea is that first we, we compile only the spots which are slower, uh, which are, sorry, which are executed mm, for the most time. And, uh, and then how do we make them fast? Well, we do it by specialized the code basically. So if we see that uh, a certain loop or a function uh, is run with uh, integers, like we have an addition with integ integers, we, special, we, we produce a specialized version of assembler which knows that these variables are integers. And if later, by chance, we, we see that we have floats or strings or lists or whatever, we produce another specialized version of, this, uh, of your Python code which is passed on these, uh, these new types. And the idea is that you pre-compute as much information as possible during the JIT compilation phase so that once you have finished, uh, you just, you, your assembler code does only the interesting things and the ones who are really needed for, uh, for your code. For example, suppose you have this line of code which is, well, it happens very often in, in Python programs, object.foo, it's, it's a method call. And uh, this is a very simplified version of what's happening. So first of all, we look, up, we look up foo in the dictionary of the object, of the instance. Then if it's not found, we look up it in the class. And then if it's not found in the, in the class, we, we start looking it, look, looking it up in the um, base class and the, and the base of the base class and etc. And finally, when we found it, we execute. And uh, if you are, Interpreting, you have to do these steps again and again and again. Suppose you have this object.foo in a loop that you run it um, one million times, you have to do a little cap one million times. And uh, so the, the idea is that in, 
PyPy, you pre-compute the lookup so that you know which function code corresponds to foo, and, um, and so you can jump directly to it. But of course, well, Python is dynamic, so things can change because I could change the, the class of the object, I could uh, add and remove attributes, either on the object or on the class, uh, and uh, I can do all sort of tricks, and these tricks are done in uh, real world programs. So the, the idea is that we compile the code pretending that object.class is constant and that the class hierarchy is constant and, uh, and so we can do the inlining, do constant propagation and et cetera. To make sure that our code is still behaving correctly, we, we insert a guard, which is a quick runtime check that we do, that our assumptions are still true if the guard fails, then it means that the assembler code we are interpreting, we are executing is no longer valid or no valid for this case. And so we, we bail out and uh, we restart interpreting uh, things. Yes, it's going to be slower, but it's better to be slower than be incorrect, of course. And uh, eventually we will compile a new version of the assembler for uh, this, this new assumption and et cetera. So at the end, uh, we, we get a situation in which all the parts of the code which are executed often are going fast because we have JIT compiled it, everything. The, the, the hard part is uh, who decides what to specialize on? Because for example, yes, I said we specialize on the class of the object. And, uh, but we could uh, specialize on the number of the attributes or uh, if the object starts with O or, uh, or something like this. Um, there, basically, we, we have to do some heuristics and uh, the, the PyPy code is written in a way which assumes that something is more constant than the other things. So we assume that usually classes of objects don't, don't change very often but the value of the attributes can change, so we, we, pr we promote the class model to the values. And um, we assume that usually the modules are kind of constant. It's not that we add and remove function to, to the modules at run times. We can do, in that case, yes, we specialize to twice or three times, but uh, it, it's kind of a safe assumption. And uh, sometimes we, we just have uh, constants in the bytecode, so if you write uh, a plus one, one is the constant, and then we assume that the constant is constant, yes. And this is, this is usually true. Of course, specializing is a, is a trade off, because if you specialize too much, then we spend most of our time uh, compiling new code and not reusing the one we, we, which we already have. And uh, so we consume memory and we spend most of, all of the time compiling things. If we don't specialize enough, we produce inefficient code, because for example, if you don't specialize on the class of the object, we have to do look up again and again. So yes, it's a trade off and uh, it, it's our job to find the, the best. And this brings us to the next point, which is how to write our code in a way that it's friendly to PyPy. Of course, unfortunately, we, we cannot spend much time on this. It's like a topic which can be one week long, not uh, half an hour. Uh, but uh, one, one, one point of view is that uh, you should not do the, the things that you have done until now. Uh, usually to optimize uh, pure Python code without using external tools, you did things like uh, um, trying to avoid uh, method lookups, so you, maybe you save the bound method in a variable and then call it repeatedly, or uh, you try to call, yes, you see this is a, something that, where is the mouse? Hmm? Uh, this one? Yes. yes. This is something that Guido wrote a couple of years ago. Be suspicious of function method calls because creating a stack frame is expensive. That is completely untrue in PyPy because the, the functions are inline. So basically, if you follow the, this kind of advice, um, you, you, do, you write worse Python code because you are trying to optimize it manually. And uh, if you just write nice Python code, the PyPy JIT compiler can do it for you. So a couple of points that are a general advice of how you should write Python code. Uh, simple is better than complicated, uh, which means that 
if you write really uh, plain Python code, which is self-explained and uh, that you can understand it well, well, probably the JIT compiler can do it as well, and uh, it has a better clue on what what's going on, and um, it has better chances to optimize it. Uh, you should avoid to do string concatenation in the loop because the SMC Python is usually fast because there is uh, one optimization which works only if your string is uh, as a, only a reference count of one. We can, can't do this optimization, so you should avoid it both on CPython and PyPy. You should try to avoid uh, iter tools monster. Sometimes I see pieces of code which are an iter tools call to another iter able to a generator which calls another iter tools and etc. And I, I have no idea what it's doing and uh, if you have good for you. And, uh, but uh, this kind of confuses the, the PyPy JIT. If you just write your nice Python loop and uh, with nested loop and explain what you are doing, uh, it, there are chances that the JIT can do, can optimize it as well as other tools or even better. The other usual advice is to write stuff in C. Well, no, uh, this is good for CPython because the Python code, the pure Python code on CPython is very slow compared to C. But if you write stuff in C, then the PyPy JIT cannot know what is happening. So it, it has to stop optimizing at some point and call to C. If you write everything in pure Python, the the PyPy JIT has a better knowledge of what's going on and has a better uh, chances to, uh, to optimize your code uh, up to until the, the best performance it can. And uh, so the, if you want to interface with external C code, the best thing to do is use a CFFI, which works both on C, Python, and PyPy, and it's fast and optimized, and et cetera. You should avoid the C extensions, which are using the C, Python, C API. We have this compatibility layer but it's really a, a, like an emulation of preference counting and uh, other things, and it's very slow on PyPy. Yes, it works. It, it's useful if you want to try your software and et cetera, but uh, if you're using a C extension with using the C Python C API, we in, a, in, a, in a part of the code which is important from a personal point of view, it's going to, to kill all your performance. And then you, 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 you should try to avoid things which confuse the PyPy JIT in the way I was explaining earlier. For example, we assume that the class is a constant and classes are kind of fixed at, from some point on, so you should avoid creating classes at tr runtime. If you have a function call and inside the function you create the class and then you return an object of, after instantiating this class, yes, this is valid Python, it works on PyPy, but then the JIT will specialize on, on this new class again and again without uh, reach, uh, reaching a, a fixed point. Note that it, it, it's not that it's not allowed. You can create new classes, for example, during import time because you want to do some uh, metaprogramming and et cetera, it is perfectly valid. But if you create one million classes, well, the JIT will create one million assemblers, basically. And uh, for example, this is a, an example of what you should not do to optimize your code because if you try this, Monster saying uh, apply operator dot at getter of x and map it to, to the, the element of the list and etc. Well, it's much, much easier to just write the list comprehension. And uh, this is the kind of advice you, you find on the web. And if you measure it, on CPython it's exactly the same speed, so it's not, <laughs> it's not true even of, on CPython. And on PyPy, the first one is just a bit slower. So Please just do write your nice Python code, which is understandable, and the JIT will uh, remove the overhead for you. If you want to know more about PyPy, we are around for the whole week, so just ask something uh, uh, to, to, to us. Tomorrow, we are, there is an open space in the A4 room at 18, so we'll, it probably will be a Q&A session, so just come and uh, ask. And uh, yes, uh, before, the good, yes, right. Maciek wants to show you a better demo of VM Pro. Yes, so since we have some time, I did, well, we did the experiment yesterday to see a Django example. It's a small Django example, and like it's obviously rigged to show slow parts. Uh, up. 
main dot pi. So this is the Django example, and index does some spurious pickle calls. And I guess this is the the, the thing I wrote and like wanted to see: can I find this stuff using using VMProf and like make sure uh, things things work nicely? So I'm gonna run it first on C Python. Um, So I want to upload to the local host and I'm gonna run manage.py run server. And now because it's it's Django, it starts like multiple processes when one like if you just run it like this, you end up profiling the watchdog process which does nothing. Thank you very much. No reload. And then I'll disable threading just in case. Okay, I'm running the server on port 8001. I look at it. Host 8001. It says, okay, good, fine. Uh, so I'm gonna run a simple AB and I'm not going to listen to you saying that AB is a terrible tool, but I want to just send some requests to Munch, 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 thinking. Well, it's C Python, so I can probably just stop it. 4,000 requests is fine because there's no JIT warm up time or anything like that. And then, like, uploads the, the profiling data. Hop. Pretty sure it's trying to load fonts or something. Okay, so we have, we have Django doing its job, which has billion whole stack of billion functions. Handle, run, call, call, get response, index. Okay, so I click on index, and index actually spent only 47% doing the actual job. Uh, but as you can see, that dumps here itself spend like 66% of, of the total thing. So if we, if you kill that, the, the spurious pickle that I put there, it should be like 50% faster, okay. Fine. Uh, now I'm gonna run the same thing on PyPy. Hop, hop. Start slow and then like start warming up and get the request faster. This is how JIT works. It takes time to warm up. It really depends on your workload, but it's usually something you can run, if you, if you run for five seconds, then it's fine. So like this, this was like um, 600 requests a second, so like about 3,000 requests here was fine. Uh, we, we did measure, yes. yes, this is the longest request, it takes 46 milliseconds, and here the 50% takes below one. So you see the warm up is really slow. Uh, I think so, and then I try using Java, and then it's really, really slow. So it's not that bad, but it's still relatively slow. Uh, the overhead here of profiling we checked the other day was like, here was like 660 requests a second without the profiler on. So that's, that's what, 40, that's below 10% anyway, it's like 8%. Uh, if I look. It's really not working, eh? Here, this is. If I look here, uh, okay, I can't scroll to the right because it doesn't render. Ah, maybe, no, <laughs> I don't know. So what I was trying to show <laughs> is that here we have normal, the jungle stack, which is five billion f levels deep. And here it goes run, call, call, response, index, somewhere, somewhere there. But the index itself spends far less time than on CPython. Like if you click on index, it's like 32% spend on, on, on doing index. And there's one very, this guy, which is make style and like, uh, what is the name of this guy? It's color style. So that made me wonder, because 
my, my little program that returns OK does not do much coloring, as far as I can tell. So we looked at what's going on there. Mm. And Django search, uh, Django core management color. Uh, what was the, the guy's name? Color style. Color style. Mm. This guy, make style. So make style does something. And as you can see, it defines a class within the function body for no actual reason whatsoever, as far as I can tell. And this thing alone makes this simple benchmark about 30% slower. Like, if you remove this and do that, hop, boom. We made Django 30% faster by <laughs> <laughs> on this absolutely idiotic benchmark, I agree, but still. Pull request pending. browser thing is not really working. Uh, anyway, qu questions, I suppose. Uh, hi. Uh, thank you for the presentation. It was very interesting and fun. I have two questions. The first one is, uh, do you plan uh, about Profiler, the both of the questions? Uh, do you plan to support Windows? Because I, that, as far as I understood, you use signals, and uh, there are no signal, signals and on Windows. So yes, we plan to support Windows. We didn't make a precise plan just yet how to do it. But we per probably what you can do is you can just run a s separate thread, then like the, the C-level thread, and then just sample the stack. You have to be very, very careful, but maybe things are possible. I, I don't know. Like the, we, we support Linux right now, 64-bit Linux. We have plans for support, like OS X is in the process, and Windows will look how to support, but I don't know yet. If there is, there is high demand, we will support it. <laughs> okay. Oh, for PyPy. PyPy works on Linux, OS X, and on the f Windows. Uh, and on 32-bit, 64-bit Intel, except Windows. It doesn't work on 64-bit Windows. You, you, you can run. I mean, what are the system calls you use for the version of system? You mean for the profiler or for PyPy itself? I'm just trying to estimate how complex would it work with some, I don't know, FreeBSD. So FreeBSD actually works. It's not officially supported, but it works. People ported it. But Generally speaking, it's the same as for Python. Like the, the, m most of the stuff that you, uh, that you are porting are CPython standard library and all the calls there. So the effort is very, very similar. Like we use a few extra calls to, to say compile assembler, allocate this, but as long as you're not supporting awkward architecture like MIPS or something, then it's relatively easy. Uh, yeah, uh, the second question. Uh, about profiler, um, I, I didn't uh, quite understood. Is it possible to prof to make cross profiling between C and Python? And if it is possible, how how do you do that? So you what what happens is is you capture the entire C stack, and you f you have C stack that includes special entries for Python functions. I can show you later. Okay. But like the the idea is that you have all the C calls, and then you just throw them away. So Having extra SQLs present there, it's very easy. The, the only problem is then you need your dwarf data to be present. Like, you need to be able to look up the symbols. But other than that, uh, the support is already there. <laughs> okay, thank you. Hi. Is it fully compatible with Python 2.7? Can I just replace yes. CPython with PyPy? So for the most part, yes. The, the only difference is you might want to look into C extensions. Not all C extensions work. But if your code is pure Python, then generally works. Is there a way to check, for example, I have a Django project to see if all requirements are compatible? Well, you create virtual end and try to install it. Like typically what, what you need to do in stuff like that, you need to replace, say, MySQL bindings with MySQL CFFI bindings. So they're, they're usually, for most stuff that's popular, there are equivalent libraries that do the same thing, but instead of being a C extension, use 
use CFFI. So I can't replace my C Python directly. I have to do some additional work. Depends. If, if it's Django project, then you usually need to slightly change your requirements. OK, thank you. Hello. So uh, I have a question. If you, have, um, if you want to write a function, and you would have multiple ways to implement it, and you don't know which one would be better, and when you compare, when you compare the times, then you, you kind of the times kind of get different over time because the garbage collector kind of is always present. You cannot disable it, right? In PyPy. Yes. Y yes, but then you just do more statistics. Like okay. So you average over time. Just running more time. Okay. Yeah. Okay. But garbage collector in PyPy is already incremental. So if you if you exclude the JIT warm-up time, which is slow at the beginning, then the the GC will be spread almost evenly across across uh, okay, your stuff. Because yes, assuming that you do a warm-up, but then you will get some spikes in in. Not in anymore. We fixed that. Sorry. Not anymore. Oh. We have incremental garbage collector, so it th does a little bit of work. Well, okay, like small spikes. Again. I mean, not, not that that big. Uh, good luck trying to measure them. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Thank you. You're running very quickly into the resolution of your clocks. Like below millisecond, which is like most garbage collection spikes, the resolution is really bad. Uh, okay. Uh, does jitting work in a separate thread? Is it one thread or how does it work? Mm, or so does it just stop and There compile? is a talk by Armin about how to remove global interpreted lock in Python, but right now PyPy, as it is as you download it, will do everything in one thread. So part of the deal is that the JIT is a tracing JIT, so it does some work by, mm, by running stuff bit by bit. So you can't do it in a separate thread because you, you're really running stuff bit by bit. Then like optimizing and emitting assembler, you could in theory do, do, do this in background thread, which we never implemented. Okay, so now the function just ap approaches, compiles, and then runs the com compiled version. Ye yes, okay. for the most part. Thanks. It's slightly more complicated than that, but yes. More questions? Larry here? No? Uh, if I have a project with a Cython extension, um, would it work with PyPy or do I need to change it? So if you have a new enough Cython, it usually works, but it's slow. So the extension will be slow because it will go through C Python C API. There's some effort to A, make it faster and B, uh, I don't know, maybe just like make Cython compile stuff to CFFI bindings instead of compiling it to C and then, then but that, that work did not materialize just yet. May, may yes, you yes, may. I, no, I, w I want to add something, because for example, something that I did a couple of days ago is to try to speed up something which both on C Python and PyPy, and I did by use the pure mode of Cython, so I have the, the type declaration in a separate file, so on C Python I compile it with Cython and it's fast, and uh, on PyPy I just ignore the, the Cython part and it's, Pure Python and it works fast, so I think this is like the best uh, the best way to use Python. Of course, it doesn't work if you want to interface with C, C library. Then you have to use CFFI. But yes. Uh, did you ever measure um, the amount of time you spend in in PyPy? I mean, exam for example, you have a process. And this process spends some time on doing uh, the work which is needs to be done for for Python, yeah, Python code, and you have your own JIT and all the stuff in PyPy. Did you ever measure this amount? Uh, yeah, I, I think you are speaking about the the time we spend in the JIT compiler, for example. Yes. Time spent in PyPy. Uh, yes. Well, uh, how can I go back to VM Pro? The job, well, the, the browser. Mm, I don't know. 
Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, here, in this case, it doesn't work because it shows 100% interpreting. But, for example, uh, VMProf show you how much time you spent uh, uh, warming up, which means JIT compiling, how much time you spent in the garbage collector, how much time you spent in uh, the interpreter, and uh, the green, well, the green box uh, is uh, JITed. So, I, I, I think it is your question? Yes, this is wrong. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know why it didn't it didn't detect the uh, the jitted code. Hmm? Yes. Well, 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 it still shows zero, hundred percent, but the pi pi is still wrong. Okay. That's just me. So pi pi is has zero overhead. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I I'm not sure I understand the question. Like, w what do you mean? Spend time in pi pi. All this time is spent in pi pi. In PyPy, you do like your own work. You need, for example, gene compilation or garbage collecting, and there is like user code which is wrote. Yes. Yeah, so we mean how much time we spend in runtime and how much time we spend in user code. So yes. the y yes, we, we will measure that. Like examples of runtime are like dict lookups. Like dict lookups are not JIT compiled, but it's usually very useless for users to know that unless. Unless you really want to know like how much time you spend in big number calculations or stuff like this, then it's usually not very interesting to know how much time is spent in this C functions or how much time is spent in, in the user code. Like, do you care if your, your code is calling dict lookup and then spending some time in, in an, like a little helper or, or not? Like, crowd doesn't matter. Yes, but yes, okay. Yes. So you mean it's Python overhead compared to what? To the same program written on Java? Yes, or maybe in C++. Well, then the answer is like, there's no really good answer for that question because you wouldn't write it the same way. You would use different libraries. You would do different things. Like in some places you would not use a list, you would use a dictionary, stuff like this. Like. If you write the things exactly the same, what's the speed comparison between Python and Java? That doesn't have a good answer as a question. Like, it really depends on the program a lot. Like, our JIT compiler is quite good. Like, the best case scenario is as fast as Java, roughly. But you don't always hit the best case scenario. If you write Python code that looks like, I don't know, like, like this, where class style was defined inside, for example, you wouldn't write that code in Java, right? Because you can't do it. So, <laughs> see, like... Well, you, you can write it in Java, but it would not be the same inside. <laughs> After compilation, of course. Y yes, so, so the, the... Python lets you write... If you ask, like, what's the... If you take Java code and write exactly code like Java in Python, then PyPy will be roughly at the same speed with not much d difference. If you write code that does tuple of s dot upper for s in like, I don't know, keyword arguments of the function dot keys, which you can't r really write in Java very easily, then it probably will be slower than the equivalent in Java where you actually have to iterate by hand over them, for example. So it, it really depends what sort of style you follow. Python lets you do things that are expensive and they're not hard to write, and we are trying to optimize them, but we don't always do as good job as if you're writing in C, you would never allocate memory yourself because it's, 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 pain, it's, it's real pain to deal with. Because then you have to remember where to free, how to exit the function. But in Python, it's very easy to allocate memory all the time. I've seen routinely like comparisons of PyPy and C. And in PyPy, they used a list and append. And in C, they used like pre-built buffer of, of 1,000 because allocating lists that you have to resize is just too hard. And, but this is apples and oranges again. Well, I hope that answers your question. Yeah, thanks. Any other questions? Thank you for the talk. Uh, my question is, will type hints help PyPy? <laughs> no. <laughs> the short answer is no. So the thing is, like, if you, do, if you do JIT compilation, you know all the types anyway because the types are what's actually there. So you actually know 
the, the, the longer answer is that type hints are not precise enough for the sort of stuff that PyPy does. Like, PyPy would not only specialize on the class name, it would specialize on what shape of the class is there. So, for example, what sort of attributes are present on this precise object. And this is something that you can't express with type hints. So, type hints are actually not even not helping. They're, they're not, not they're, you can't do the same things as we do in the JIT. We, we can do whatever type hints allow you to do, and we do that, and we, we do more. So I have a question for the VM prof. It's very interesting. Are you using it to determine where PyPy is relatively not that much better than CPython? So you did a lot of switching back and forth between the two cases in your web page. Do you have an integrated view that tells you uh, in this PyStorm benchmark, for example, uh, PyPy is particularly good in PROC1, but it's relatively bad in PROC3. Do you have that? Do you intend to have that? Because I would presume it helps you find test cases where PyPy can be improved for a given program. That's a very good point. I didn't think about it before, but it's probably something very, very useful. Like, to be able to compare, like, not even two interpreters, but also, like, two different libraries, for example, or, like, two different setups for a function and like say, okay, if I do this, what actually happens to the profile? Pfft, that sounds like a good idea. Um, I think I checked about six months ago and PyPy is incompatible with GEvent. Um, has that changed and yes. is it gonna change? Uh, okay. Yeah, so I, I think the new release of GEvent will support PyPy. I mean, the trunk version al already does. Hello, just a quick, a quick question about uh, VMProf. Uh, is it uh, possible to customize the sampling rate for uh, sampling? So yes, there is an option to customize the sampling rate. The problem is that Linux signals won't allow you more than like the system clock, which is around 300 hertz. I think it's 30 minutes, I don't remember, but it's like around that n number that you can't go lower without changing strategy completely to something like threads, which we might need to do for Windows anyway, so. And does, does it uh, increase the overhead linearly? Y yes, yes, obviously. It, it w would if you sample more often than like, if you yeah. are at 300 hertz, you are, have like 30 milliseconds of time in between. And in yeah. this time you're doing your job and like also like the sampling. Yeah, okay, thanks. Hello, and again, thanks for the talk. And I have the question about the PyPy. So you showed the example that making a class inside the function is bad. It obviously is pretty bad in CPython as well, because of some overhead. But my question is, uh, let's say there's some testing library that mocks the classes. So how do you deal with monkey patch and stuff? So Maybe de like Depends on the setup a lot, but the, 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 if you just mock the stuff and do you mock the stuff for each fun? Well, like, I mean, we are talking about stuff that's called millions of times. If you mock it for like each call of the, of the test function, how many test functions do you have? Like 500, that's definitely not a problem at all. And I mean, those test functions won't be jetted anyway because- No, I mean, uh, what you were saying is your assumption is that the class is a constant. So I am obviously when a monkey patch, I change this constant at the runtime. Yes, but do you do it a million times or do you do it like- No, times? I'm going to do it like several times when? a run. No, that, that's completely fine. Oh, so it's a float, it's a kind of float in assumption. Yeah, yeah. So it's, it's only see. if you're like really having this sort of stuff, like in th this example, the, this make style is oh, called see. for every request and I'm doing 10,000 of those. Thanks, that clarifies for me. But, uh, one more note, it's not that it, the code is incorrect. I mean, the, the Python semantics is always preferred. It's, it's just that if you do this kind of two dynamic style, maybe you, you have bad performance, but it still works. Hey, um, I was just wondering, is there a linter or something that I can run to tell me about that, that the class is a bad idea in the end? 
No, it would, it would be nice to have, but no. Sorry? Yes. Yes, but yes. Please do. <laughs> this file is from Django, right? Django, yes. This is from Django. Django has code in it that says, if we're running on Pocket PC, don't do something. People try to run Django on their Pocket PC on Python. <laughs> yes. It's the, that file is dealing with like reading the, ter the terminal color palette or something that I, I, I really am I'm sure Django does that at all. So maybe it shouldn't do it on Pocket PC, I don't know. But in my opinion, it shouldn't be then doing that at all. Are you planning to add support for Python 3, 4, and 3, 5 in, uh, later ver in uh, PyPy anytime soon? I didn't understand that. Uh, are, are, you, are you planning to have uh, the PyPy 3K support Python version 3.4 and 3.5? Yes, eventually. Uh, the, the, prob the, the problem is that uh, there, is, there are no many PyPy developers working on it, and so it's, the development is low, but yes. Thanks. More questions? No, so thank you very much.